Good morning. Good to see everyone who came out this morning. We want to start off with a prayer for our sick. I'd like to go over a few of those who have requested prayers from us right now. Remember Greg Allen. Uh, he is home recovering from surgery. And Mark, he is going to have uh, surgery tomorrow. Susie, her surgery is still scheduled for the 30th of this month. Uh, Donna's dad, Don Wallace, uh, he starts cancer treatments on his uh, liver cancer tomorrow. Catherine, talked to her this morning. She said her, her pain is better, but uh, you know she's still having cancer treatment, so please remember Catherine and, and Jim also for Jim's battle. Uh, let's not forget uh, him. Uh, Margaret says Earl is home and he's not doing well right now. And Gary also uh, is home and not feeling well this morning. Uh, one announcement that does not pertain to the sick. Uh, we were going to start back with individual classes uh, starting next Sunday. Uh, we feel that with the amount of people that we have here now, we can still maintain a good uh, uh, social distance from one another. Uh, if not, if the numbers are bigger, which we uh, would really like to see the numbers bigger, we can move to a, to a bigger classroom if we need to. And if you are one of the teachers for this quarter, uh, the material that you'll need is in uh, the classrooms also. So at this time, if you would, let's clear our minds and let's pray to God for our sick. Almighty God, we come to you this morning. We seek your mercy, Lord. We seek your healing power, Father, on behalf of our sick here. We have those who are battling cancer, those who are fixing to go into surgeries, Father, we have those who are home, shut in, who are in rest homes. Father, both those who are physically sick and those who are spiritually sick. We pray for all these folks, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would look down on them and that you would strengthen them today. We ask that you would please help them not to be in so much pain. We ask that you would ease their anxieties as they are battling their illnesses and as they are waiting for surgeries. Father, you calm us like no nothing else can. We ask, Father, that you would please be with them. Father, Father all of those who are uh, not here, who are home, who can't be here, Lord, we ask that you would please be with them and strengthen them. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be with our country. Although we have so many great divisions among us, we ask that you would please help us all to be united, one in Christ. Help us to look out for our fellow brother and sister. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to treat each other with, with love and understanding. Lord, we ask that you would please help us not to be a proud people, but help us to be humble. Please uh, help us never to be afraid to stand up for, for Jesus and for your word and what it means to us. Help us always try to show others that Christ lives in us by the way that we live, by the way that we talk. Father, please forgive us of any wrongs that we have against us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Good morning. All right. I left my pitch pipe at home today, so I'm going to do the best I can. <laughs> but, uh, all right. First, we're going to sing uh, number 721. We're going to sing all three verses. <clears throat> 
My latest sun is sinking fast, my race is nearly run. My strongest trials now are past, my triumph is begun. Oh, come angel band, come and around me stand. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. I know I'm near the holy ranks of friends and kindred dear. I brush the dews on Jordan's banks, the crossing must be near. Oh, come angel band, come and around me stand. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. I've almost gained my heavenly home, my spirit loudly sings. The holy ones, behold, they come, I hear the noise of wings. Oh, come, angel band, come and around me stand. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. All right, before our uh, opening prayer this morning, we'll sing number 574, and uh, we're going to sing the first and second verse. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. I'm going to have our opening prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, it is indeed our great joy to come here and gather together in your presence. We're thankful, Father, for the ability to come and worship without fear of retribution from the world. Father, we come to you at this time with great thanksgiving. We are living in a time of great peril. And yet, your word shines through and provides for us a guide by which that we, should, that we can live our lives and know peace. We come to you with thanksgiving, Father, because you have answered our prayers. We've sent prayers to you of things which we need, of things which we want, of things which we desire. And we know that each prayer has been answered. We also know that sometimes it doesn't get answered in a way which we believe it should be. But we always know that it's answered in the way that you know it should be. But Father, we're still thankful. We're thankful for your son Jesus who came and died on the cross for our sins. We're thankful for this gathering this morning. We're thankful for everything that we have. And we're thankful, Father, for your protection from the evil one. 
But Father, we come to you now and we ask your blessing upon this gathering this morning, upon our worship service, and we pray that what we do today is what pleases you. We have gathered here today of one mind, of one body, to worship together you in accordance with your will, knowing the sacrifice of your son on the cross, knowing that if it hadn't been for him, we wouldn't be here today. But Father, we come to you with prayers for our elderly who are vulnerable, our young who are vulnerable, and for those of us in between, that we be strong for all of those who need us to be strong. Father, we pray for those who are traveling, those who are home ill. We ask for safety and healing. For those who are suffering, we ask for comfort. And for those, Father, who are lost, we ask you to send us their way so that we might teach you, teach them your truth and that truth might set them free. Go with us now, Father, as we do these many things this day. We ask that you guide our hearts, direct our minds, and above all, forgive us for we fail you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, next we're going to sing number 797, and we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. Lord, we come before Thee now, at Thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain, shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on Thee our souls depend, in compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with thy rich grace. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. Grant that all may seek and find the God supremely kind. Heal the sick, the captive free. Let us all rejoice in thee. Let us all rejoice in thee. Uh, before we take the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, we're going to sing number 376, and we're going to sing all three verses. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt on Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. 
One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, amazing grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father in heaven, your son truly did pay that debt that debt that we could not pay. It is through his sacrifice that we are truly thankful that we have the forgiveness of sins. We remember his sacrifice, Father, at this time as we take this bread that reminds us, reminds us of his body, how he suffered for us. Father, we are truly saddened by what had had to have been done but he did it for us because he loved us as we take of this bread now bless us as we partake of this bread representing his body in christ's name amen As we reflect now back to the cross, our minds are on Jesus. Our minds are on his suffering and the blood that was shed for us. This blood cleanses us from sin now. This is the blood of the new covenant. Our Father, we just are so sad and do have your son die in our stead but he did so and he did so willingly and he paid that price as we partake of this fruit of the vine may we do so in a pleasing way in Christ's name amen All right, we're going to sing a few songs here before Rex brings us our lesson. Uh, this first one we're going to sing is not in the book. It's a sanctuary. I think most of you know it. Um, the words might be a little different, but we'll uh, do what we can. <laughs> oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, teach your children to stop the fighting. Start uniting all as one. Let's get together, loving forever. Sanctuary, Lord, for you. You were the one, Lord, who sent the Savior, heart and soul, Lord, for our land. It is you, Lord, who knows my weakness. You refine us with your own. 
own hand. O Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. All right, the next song we're going to sing is uh, 122, and we're going to sing the first and third verse. Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made it my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule there alone. The love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercies. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God glows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose his glory till we see him face to face. While his love runs true and bright, we are walking in the light. He has shown us the road. We his glory must reflect, lest our dimness and neglect keeps the soul from his God. The love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God glows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose his glory till we see him face to face. All right, before uh, Rex brings us our lesson, we're going to sing 753. Uh, if you would, let's stand for this song. Uh, we're going to sing all three verses. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong, farther along we'll know all about it, farther along we'll understand why, so cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine, we'll understand it all by and by. Faithful till death, said our loving master, a few more days to labor and wait. Toils of the road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through the beautiful gate. Farther along we'll know all about it. Farther along we'll understand why. So cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then I shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. 
So farther along we'll know all about it. You know, farther along we'll understand why. So cheer up, my brothers, our live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Have you seated? Good morning. You know, it's uh, food to me is is uh, or going to eat is not about the food to me. Uh, when you sit and eat with your family, when you sit and eat with your friends, it's more than uh, the food. You know, the food's important, I guess. And, Lord knows I like good food as much as anybody in here, but the truth is that's not the point, you know? It's about fellowship, isn't it? It's about being included in something. You know, we know a lot of people, don't we, in our lives, all of us in here. We all have a lot of acquaintances, people we know by name, people we see on the street, talk to, and maybe went to school with them or worked with them, or maybe we even go to church with them, I don't know, maybe people that, we, that we're acquainted with. But you know, it's uh, most of those people, that's about as far as it goes, isn't it? We say hi to them, we might talk to them on the street, we might converse them a little bit, maybe we're friends them on Facebook. But you know, uh, there's not a lot of those people that we've sat down and had a meal with, is there? You know, it's kind of different, isn't it? There's a fellowship involved in that. The idea of sitting down and taking time to, uh, to eat, to share uh, your table with someone, to share your food with someone, there's an inclusion within that that we miss and in our society we probably miss it more than we used to you know i remember years ago when me and susie very first started coming to church here back in the way back you know a long time ago i hate to use dates kind of depresses me but a long time ago back in the old building when we were young and still had dark hair and didn't have any kids and foot loose and fancy free boy those were the days wasn't it? and we were uh and we were in this building over here, and there was a couple that went to church here uh, back in those days, and uh, most of you in here might not even remember them, but Gene and Lee Allred, and they were just great people, and, and um, Lee was a truck driver and made his living driving a truck, driving a freight truck for a LTL stuff, and we had some stuff in common, and, and uh, I remember one Sunday night after church, uh, Liz and Gary was with us, and me and Susie, and, and they said, come up and have a cheeseburger at the house, or, and we did, and it wasn't nothing fancy, it was just a cheeseburger, but, you know, that's been a long time ago, my, my oldest daughter's 30 years old, and I did date myself then, didn't I, a little bit, but that's been a lot of years ago, but I still remember going up on the hill up here, and, and uh, going to their house, and sitting there, and having that little cheeseburger, nothing special, just a cheeseburger, but well, what an impression that made on me, that they invited me up and sat down and to eat with them and to talk and made me feel important, made me feel uh, special. So meals a lot of times are a lot more than just food, aren't they? They're uh, important to us. And in the times of Jesus, they were really important. Meals had a lot of significance. Food was hard to prepare in those days, I'm sure. I think we kind of forget that sometimes. You know, my grandmother, she used to cook all day long. And I imagine back years ago, before the days of microwaves and, and uh, TV dinners and McDonald's, you know, it was a lot of work to cook a meal. I can't imagine actually having to cook a meal on a wood stove. Can you? Uh, bread and meal and meat and having to do all that. That would be a big deal, wouldn't it? And to have people come and sit down and to share that with you that was a that was a big thing you know jesus often got invited to meals didn't he it was often criticized for that you eat with tax collectors and sinners it wasn't one thing for him to be with them or to meet them but when he said you eat with them there was a different level in that wasn't there you sit down and you share a meal with them you share a table with them that was different in jewish thought different in that idea it was more than a meal 
It was the idea of fellowshipping with them. You're fellowshipping with tax collectors and sinners. You're not just speaking to them. You're not just preaching to them. You're not just talking to them. You're fellowshipping with them. We talked this morning about the Jerusalem Council in Acts and how that relates in Galatians chapter 2 where, where Paul condemned Peter because Peter was eating when the Jews came to Antioch. Peter was just eating with the Jews and he quit eating with the Gentiles. And Paul says, I stood and condemned him to his face. Because why? Because he had removed that fellowship from the Gentiles. It was a big thing. It was an important thing to do that. When somebody asks you to their house or to their home or maybe even to a restaurant, and they ask you to share a meal with them, there's a lot more to that than just, than just eating. If it's just sustenance, if it's just food, we can go to McDonald's and eat on the curb and take care of that problem, right? I mean, we might not like it. But we'll live, probably. So, I mean, you know, we can do that. We can take care of that. That's not a big deal. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's the time together, the time and the fellowship, and the idea of fellowshipping with someone else. I think that in this sermon, I, I really focused on that thought and on that idea. And that, so the scriptures we're using this morning are not, they're not... Um, they're not, I'm not really going to have them in front of you this morning. There's just not a lot of scriptures on the board as we go through this today. But what I am going to ask you to do is look at a couple of passages. Uh, look at a couple of passages with me because I think that they're, that they're important ideas. And the concepts, it was hard for me just to put it into one, into one real thought, uh, into, one, into one process. So I kind of had to take it all together, and I want you to kind of do that with me this morning. So if you got your Bible, or if you don't, I, well, I think you'll get the gist of it, but if you do, uh, you know, Matthew 22, that's going to be a place we're going to be this morning, and if you want to uh, kind of mark that uh, just a little bit in Matthew chapter 22 with me, and we're kind of going to look at that passage a little bit, and that's the, that's the uh, parable of the marriage uh, feast right there if you need to kind of look at that and then the other thing we're going to look at a little bit this morning and I know it's a little different I try to put the scriptures up because I think it's easier on us but I just really couldn't uh, do that the other passage we're going to look at this morning is in Luke chapter 14 and uh, we're going to look at basically verse 7 uh, on down through verse 24 in Luke chapter 14 at times in this, and we're going to look a little bit over here at Matthew uh, chapter 22, so that might kind of help you a little bit as we go through this. You know, I think a passage that stuck with me a little in this was uh, this idea of Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 verse 11. He says, I say to you that many will come from the east and west. <laughs> I think this is really neat, because you know, we don't think about that. We always talk about heaven we talk about the marriage feast of the bride. And we talk about a lot of those ideas. I never really pictured this in my mind until today. Pictured this thought in my mind. But Jesus says, Many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Well, you know, I've said quite a few things about Jacob over the years. Well, that might be an interesting dinner conversation, but I'm prepared. <laughs> Brent's laughing at me because he knows. <laughs> but, but, you know, the truth is, is that isn't that amazing to think about that? You know, I'm going to be invited to dinner. We're going to dinner when we die. You know, that's kind of neat, isn't it? And we're going to go to dinner, and we're going to have dinner with the patriarchs. And I think that's going to be neat, and I hope that there's either a translator or in heaven we all speak the same language because I don't do Hebrew. But I really think that it would be wonderful. And we're going to get to sit there and talk to all these people. Can you imagine sitting down at the dinner table with Peter or sitting down at the dinner table with Paul? You know, we've got eternity. So, I mean, there's plenty of time to get together, right? Time's not going to be an issue. And I'm sure in heaven we're not going to get fat. And I'm sure sugar and carbs don't matter. And so it's going to be great. We're going to just have all this great food and this great time, and we're going to be sitting and talking to all these great people. Isn't that going to be amazing to be able to do that? What will we ask them? What will we talk about? i got a lot of questions, 
And that would be so neat. And I think that's a vision that Jesus wanted us to get here. Is that we're going to recline at the table. We're going to share a meal. We're going to have fellowship with them. It's not just going to be a matter of seeing them or meeting them. It's different, isn't it? It's not going to be like meeting them on the street, meeting them on the gold-paved street. Hey, Abraham, how's it going today? Come over and have dinner. Sounds good, right? And that will be such a neat idea to go fellowship and sit in the house with them or in the mansion with them or our dwelling or whatever it is, however that works, and to be able to talk to them and have that fellowship. And that's what this is about. It's about the idea of having fellowship. You know, and that all starts with an invitation, doesn't it? It all starts with being invited. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. You know, the first part of any meal, of having a meal with someone, is inviting them to come eat with you. You know, that seems kind of like a simple idea doesn't it doesn't seem real hard to invite someone but it kind of is isn't it you know maybe more so for women sometimes maybe than men and maybe I shouldn't make that gender specific but you you invite somebody into your home to eat with you you kind of open yourselves up to some things don't you they get to see your house maybe how you live maybe not as tidy as maybe you might like or maybe they might think something about that maybe I don't know it's a little bit uh, intimidating sometimes to have somebody at your house for the first time you don't know how they're going to react or how maybe you're going to react and so it's kind of interesting when we invite someone sometimes people are a little bit uh, reluctant maybe to accept an invitation maybe they feel a little bit um, inadequate in your home or maybe they feel like maybe they don't have enough in common with you conversation could lag right Maybe we don't have a lot of things to talk about. And maybe we'll run out of small talk. There's, it's a little bit intimidating. It's kind of hard sometimes, isn't it? It gets us out of our comfort zone a little bit to invite somebody to do that. My Aunt Audrey, she loved to entertain people. That's one thing I remember about her more than anything else is she just loved to entertain. It was her thing. She had really nice china and, a really ni and it was big to her. And she would... Put the spread on. We call it putting on the dog, right? I mean, she had put it out. She would cook all day and make this meal and put the best china on the table. And, 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 and it was just grand. And she would wear a really nice dress and, and it would just be, it was a big thing. Well, our meals aren't like that at my house. We're more like throw the food on the table and eat type people and talk. But, you know, the truth is she enjoyed that. And some people do. And some people it's a real stretch for them to open themselves up to that idea. You know, in Luke chapter 14, chapter 7, it says, And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests. This is at a meal that Jesus was at in Luke chapter 14 and verse 7. And he says he was... Speaking about to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. You know, these are people that have been invited and accepted that invitation. But then when they accepted the invitation, then there was an issue. They wanted to have the honored seats. You know, when people go out to eat with me, we all know the honored seats are the ones close to me, right? Or they can talk to me, you know. But, but anyway, but the truth is, they wanted the honored seats. They wanted to sit close to the guy in charge. They wanted to be close to Jesus. They wanted to sit in them places where they could be heard and where they could hear what was going on. They wanted, it was important to them. They were invited, but they wanted to be honored guests. You know, that's a little different, isn't it, to be an honored guest somewhere. The honored guest gets to sit next to the person that hosts it they they get to sit in close proximity to what's going on the on uh, the unhonored guests the regular guests sit further off they have to crane their neck to hear what's going on and they hear the laughter but they don't get the joke right so they want to be close to what's going on and that's the way it was with jesus if you look at luke chapter 14 and you go down a little bit into, into chapter 12, it says, He went on to say to the one who had invited him. See, he was invited to that meal, wasn't he? It was, there was an invitation that was sent out. 
And Jesus accepted that invitation. You know, a lot of times when we invite someone to eat, they don't really want to go. They're a little scared about that. It really makes them stretch. But sometimes, after, oftentimes, after they go and they take that invitation, it turns out to be a wonderful, a wonderful time, a wonderful time to be together. And if you go to Luke chapter 14, verse 16, it says, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent to his slave to say to those who have been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all began to make excuses, the Scripture said. They all began to make excuses. I'm too busy. My daughter's getting married. There's things going on that I need to take care of. I'm too busy to sit down. It takes time to eat, doesn't it? It takes time to get ready and to get dressed and to go to dinner. It takes time to do that, and I'm just too busy to do that. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have brought, I bought a yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. You know, I remember one time in my life, this is, do you have regrets? Does anybody in here have regrets in their life? Well, I'm going to tell you one of mine that happened right here in this building. One time, several years ago, probably 10 or 12, um, Katie Bailey invited me to come have lunch with her and Junior. She says, y'all come out and have dinner with us. If you ever went to dinner at Junior and Katie Bailey's house, that was sweet. I mean, that woman knew how to cook, and Junior knew how to talk, right? And I mean, it was sweet. And... And I was in the middle of something. I was having trouble with the stupid truck. I still remember this this day. It's probably been 15 years ago. And I was having trouble with the stupid truck. And I said, oh, I just can't. i got to go fix that truck. And that's one of the biggest regrets. Now that they're dead, that's one of the biggest regrets of my life is I didn't say, yeah, I'm coming to eat. You know, the heck with everything else. I wish a million times over I'd have said, I'm going to eat. I don't care. And then... With that in mind, one day, about five or six years ago, Eileen Reed, one Sunday after church, me and Susie getting ready to go home, we didn't have the kids, Eileen says, I got dinner, come eat. I said, absolutely. And so we went over, and I can still remember Eileen fussing around, how Eileen does, making a big production of a big bunch of meal for just the three of us, right? And now that Eileen's gone, I cherish that memory, how sweet that was to have time to go and sit at her table and eat at her house. You know, I tell you, brethren, we really miss out when we don't spend time with each other. And really, eating is one of those times, it's probably some of the best times that we have to spend with one another. That's really not what this sermon's about, but it just strikes me, I guess, as I speak it and talk about these things and think about these things. Because it's the refusal. You know, that's kind of tough, isn't it? To go out and invite someone to meal. To invite someone to dinner. And then they say, oh, I just can't. You know, I've had people in my life that I've invited to dinner 10 or 15 times. And every time they say, oh, I'm so busy. Oh, I just can't. Oh, I can't do that today. I can't do that right now. And then after a while, you don't ask them anymore. Because you know, they're just not going to go. Right? You know, in these cases, and these we're looking at in this scripture, isn't that what happened? I can't go. One said, I have married a wife. I don't know what that has to do with it. But he says, for that reason, I cannot come. And the slave came back, right, and said, listen, these people have refused to come. If you look at Matthew chapter 22, it says, uh, they were unwilling, right? And he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat and lives. He's saying, I've put out the dog. Right? I've done it. My, my fat and livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. All you got to do is come and eat. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. They refused, didn't they? The dinner was ready. The feast was prepared. 
The meal was spread. All you had to do was come and eat it. And they didn't do it. You know, my grandmother, bless her heart, she loved to cook. You all know that because you heard me talk about her, but she just loved to, she loved to feed people. Just one of her things. And I loved to eat. So it was a really good relationship. And but she would we she she was used to cooking for people that worked. I mean, that's how she was raised. She grew up on farms and ranches where people were working. And, you know, that was what she did. She made dinner and people would come eat and she would clean it. So when you would go eat at grandma's house, like during the day, and so when we moved here and we had this machine shop, we run this machine shop out here, and so every day at lunch, Granny had lunch every day. And so, but when you went to eat, she knew you was working people, you know? And so she, it was ready. I mean, it was your plate, everything was there, and you sat down and you ate, and as soon as you ate, she cleaned it all up and you got up and left. And that's just how she was. She didn't expect you to do anything. She didn't ask you to do anything. She just... But she wanted you, wanted you to eat. She wanted you to make that meal. And that's how it was. And you would come in and eat. In just a few minutes, you'd be done. But, but oh, I just loved those. I loved all those meals. Uh, I still think about that. and love that. What a great time that was, just to take a few minutes uh, for her to sit and, and to eat with her. But there was no reason to refuse. She wouldn't take no for an answer. You were going to eat or else. It was just one of those things. You know, you couldn't refuse. You couldn't say, no, I'm too busy. No, you're not. You're going to eat. You know, and uh, so anyway, it's got, that was just the way it was. You couldn't refuse it. But these people refused that meal. They refused to come eat. It was all made. It was a banquet. It was a wonderful thing. But no, we can't. We've got an excuse. We're too busy. We're too, this is going on. That's going on. I just don't want to come. I don't feel comfortable. It's not something I want to do. I want us to home watch Netflix instead tonight. You know, I just don't want to go do that. So they wouldn't come. They refused it. In every case, there was a retribution in these stories. You know, we might get our feelings hard if somebody refuses, or maybe, maybe, they, maybe I don't know how it works, but possibly. But in these cases of these stories, there was a retribution. This was a big thing. This was a big feast. It was a big spread. A lot of work had gone into it. One was a marriage feast in Matthew 22. It's to honor this rich man or this Lord's son or daughter that was getting married. And so it was a big, it was a big, big thing. And they wanted, it wanted them to be there. In Luke chapter 14, this was a big dinner. It was a special occasion. And, and the slave came back and reported to his master in Luke 14, 21. The head of the household became very, became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once. Go into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. In other words, I'm mad. I'm, mad. I'm not going to invite them people anymore. I had it with them. They refused my fellowship. They refused my hospitality. They refused that and it's insulted me. You know, it's easy for us to insult people when we refuse their hospitality. You know, people, some people don't have a lot to give. It might not be the biggest spread on earth, but when they offer it to you, and to refuse it is often offensive, can be offensive to people and to our brothers and sisters in Christ when we refuse to do that. In Matthew chapter 22, it says, They paid no attention, went on their way, and they seized the slaves, and the king was enraged. 22 7. And he sent his armies and he destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Now, I don't think we'll ever go to that extreme, but he was mad. So, a lot of people think, scholars think, maybe this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jews rejecting Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem. Whether or not that's the case, I don't know, could be. But a lot of times they think that, but they were enraged. But in both of these cases, in both of these cases, they were going to fill the table. So it didn't matter if they didn't come. It didn't matter if those people that were invited, the food was made, it was prepared, things were there. Let's find somebody, right? Let's find somebody to fill the seat. Let's find somebody to fill the table. And in Matthew chapter 22, it says, Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. So the idea here is that it's made, and I'm going to fill it with someone here. I'm going to fill it with somebody. In Luke chapter 14, go at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and blind and lame. 
And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master says, Go into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Of course, we know in these parables, don't we? We're really not talking about dinners and meals and feasts. We're talking about heaven. And we're talking about eternity. You know? But it's a good relationship. The idea of Jesus preparing the feast. Preparing eternity. And those that were invited, the Jews, didn't come. And the master of the house, God, was enraged. And he says, go into the highways and find the poor and the lame and fill my table and fill my banquet hall and fill my heaven with people who will appreciate the feast that I've put before them. Jesus had a way of teaching great truths with simple things. And there's a lot in these stories. I think it's fascinating in Luke, the very last passage I read you in Luke, where he says, none of them will taste my dinner. That's pretty big, pretty big, isn't it? The unworthy, the ones that rejected Jesus, rejected His Word, rejected His salvation. And so the Gospel goes to the world, to the poor, to the Gentile, to the lame, to the sick. And the banquet hall is filled. Because as many that didn't partake, there were many who wanted to partake. They felt like they couldn't because it wasn't for them. But when it was rejected by the Jews, it became available to them. That's the story Jesus is telling. But not all those who came in were worthy. That's a little tougher thought, isn't it? They've come in to the feast. They've come in and they've sat at the table and it seems like it should be good. But in Matthew chapter 22, it says when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, and we're not talking about dinner now, right? We're talking about people in the church. We're talking about those that came in to eat. And when he came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Now scholars love this passage because they love to debate about every little thing about why he didn't have wedding clothes. But it's irrelevant. He was there and he wasn't dressed. He wasn't clothed. And he said to him, Friend, whenever anybody starts with that, you're in a lot of trouble. I'm just saying. If anybody ever comes up to you and says, friend, you better step back. <laughs> and he says, friend, he says, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot. And throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And a better translation of that in the Greek is many are invited, but few come. So that man was there, but he wasn't dressed. He wasn't worthy, was he? To be in that room. How are you dressed? 
Paul says in Galatians, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. We're clothed with Jesus Christ. That's our dress. If we're in or think we're in, but we're not clothed and we're found naked, then we're not worthy to be at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those who will be there. Have you ever been to one of those banquets that you have to RSVP? I'm not a huge fan of those, although sometimes the food is really, really good. And generally it's like all you can eat. That's a pretty good thing. But you go in and they got your name at your place. You ever done that? You don't get to choose where you sit. You got to go find your name. And they got a little name tag folded up. And you try to get there early. So if you're next to somebody you really don't want to sit to, you can like move your tag with somebody else's tag. But they put you in. Did I say that? Man. So they, so anyway, so they put you in this. So they got your place there. And you got a place. Your place. It's, uh, it's your place at the table, right? Isn't that what it is? It's your place at the table. Well, you know, God's prepared a feast. God's prepared a feast, a wedding feast, for Jesus and the bride, church. There's been a wedding feast prepared. And if you're a Christian, there's one of them little folded up little hat shaped things in front of your little golden plate with your golden silverware, in front of the golden goose that has your name on it, right? It says Rex Walter. And then beside me on my, on my left, it says uh, Peter, right? Which is pretty, that's pretty cool, I think. And I switched them so I could sit next to Peter. I just wanted you to know. Because I want to be next, I want to ask Peter some questions. But it says that right there on that on that name tag, you've got a tag. You've got a place at the table. A place that we don't deserve. We weren't the original invited guests. We weren't the honored guests that should have been there originally. But it's been open to us because they refused. They refused it. So I'm essentially sitting in somebody else's seat. Am I right? I guess you could look at it that way. But we're a place... Is at that table. You know, there was a man in 2 Samuel, and his name was Mephibosheth. And it's a long story. But Mephibosheth was a relation to Saul, and David had made a promise to find his relation, and Jonathan's, any relation to Jonathan, and to honor him. And so David, when David came into power, he searched the kingdom and he said, is there anyone left of the house of Jonathan that I may honor him? And they said, yes, there's one left, and his name is Mephibosheth. And he's lame in both feet. <clears throat> because when Saul fell from power, his nursemaid tripped when she was fleeing to save his life. And he was lame in both feet. And David says, bring him to me. So I can honor him. So they bring Mephibosheth into the hall of the king. <clears throat> you really got to put yourself into this story. Blame and blind and sick people weren't allowed into the hall of the king. They were unclean. So they bring Mephibosheth in. Mephibosheth can't walk. He's lame in both feet. And Mephibosheth falls down on his face in front of King David because he figures David's going to kill him because he's related to Saul, and he's a threat to the throne. And he's probably sure that David's just going to cut his head off right there. And Mephibosheth falls down on his face, and Mephibosheth says, what do you have to do with a dead dog like me? And David raised him up, and David said, you're going to sit at my table. This is Rex's paraphrase. You can read the whole story for yourself. And David says, you're going to sit at my table. And Mephibosheth was not worthy to sit at the table of David because Saul was no longer king. Mephibosheth was lame. And Mephibosheth, under any other rule, would have been put to death. But because of the grace of David, because he had promised Jonathan that he would honor his servant, Mephibosheth was able to swing his lame, crippled feet under the table of the king. Brethren, I'm here to tell you this morning 
We don't deserve to be at the king's table. We're like Mephibosheth. We should be falling at his feet and saying, what do you have to do with a dead dog like me? And due to the grace of God, we can swing our poor crippled soul underneath the table of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because He's invited you and He's put your name on a plate in the Kingdom of Heaven next to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And if that doesn't give you chills, it should. Because there'll be no greater feast. No greater feast. And you can be like those people and say, Lord, I don't have time for your feast. I've got things to do and places to go. And I've got people that I need to see. Maybe another time. Lord, I'm not interested in your feast because the food on the outside looks good enough to me right now. Lord, maybe another time. But that door will close. That time will pass. Your invitation will not be valid anymore. And on the day that you really want to go into that feast, those doors will be shut. And that nameplate, your name tag will be removed. And you won't be able to eat at that table. I don't know about you, but that's one dinner I want to be at. Hold my place. Save me an extra spoonful of them heavenly mashed potatoes. Because that's one dinner I don't intend to miss. But it's your choice whether you go, whether you don't go, whether you're clothed, whether you're not clothed, but you've been invited. Many are invited, but few choose to go. You've been invited. It's your decision. Are you ready to sit at that table and swing your feet? under the table of Jesus? I am. You know, in Revelation, the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, you're invited. The only question is, are you going to be prepared to go? Oh, Jesus was a great, great storyteller, was he not? He knew how to put it down where we could understand it. And I think this is pretty easy to understand. If we can help you, if you need to put the Lord on a baptism, if you're listening to us online and you need our help, need to study, need to respond, we encourage you to do that. If you're here with us this morning and need to respond, we encourage you. Take this opportunity to do that as we stand and sing. Thou of weakness, watch and pray. Find me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Sin has left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, I'll lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus feet. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left 
such a crimson stain. He washed in white snow. Are there any other announcements we need to make? If not, we're going to sing 587. We'll sing all three verses. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see him, my friends, trust in his promises grand. So sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul, let all be faithful, look to him and pray, lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today, often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain, there are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. With new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can see. So sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust Him. Who leads you, he will keep your soul and let all be faithful. Look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust in me stay, we shall have pleasure untold. So sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful look to him and pray lift your voice and praise him in song sing and be happy today Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day, Lord. And we're grateful for being able to come and worship you. Lord, we'd ask you to bless us through this week. Lord, help us help us through this week to be a better person, a better Christian. Let somebody see your light in us this week. Let us search that out. Let us search out someone to help this week along their way. Lord, and as Brother Rex said, let's not forget the invitation or ever take it for granted the, the great invitation that we've had to, to come to your banquet and let us be ready to go to it. Thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us. Help us be better people, better Christians in our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.